So, all right, Chrissy, um, let's talk about Alone. It's mm-hmm. the first Pretenders album since 2008. Uh-huh. And although, well, I have done like three albums in that time, but, you know, they have different Right, names. right, right. But did it not begin as another solo album or sort of as an I extension? never did a solo album. I just, you know, I got so tired of defending the Pretenders as a band. Everyone said, yeah, but it's just you, that I just called that Stockholm album by my name. And I don't, the band lineup has been changing, as probably all lineups do over a period of 35 years. And mine for, you know, unforeseeable circumstances that I have to change it early on. But basically, you know, it's a band. I can only work with the band. I'm not a solo artist. Yeah, so basically, no matter what you've done with it, they call it a solo or a band album. It's a collaboration. It takes Always. more than one person to do Always. it. Always. Right? Yeah, so I'm just not a solo person. Speaking of which... Uh, Except in my normal life. Right, right. Talk about uh, how it was working with Dan Auerbach. Uh, uh, well, I have admired him from afar for years with the Black Keys. And, um, and then he got into production. He's done really interesting things. I, I was thrilled that he was going to take me on. And uh, I went to Nashville, and I suppose you could say that started as a sort of solo thing because I, uh, you know, it was just me. I went over there. Um, he had the musicians together and stuff uh, who were fantastic. We recorded mm-hmm. it in two weeks. He's a real relaxed person. He just, just doesn't get stressed over anything that I've noticed. So I called him before we were going to go in about two months, and I said, man, I don't even have enough songs. He went, that's the least of my worries. He goes, well, we'll write some songs. And I went, oh, okay. Then I got there and I had, I just quit smoking. I had a respiratory infection. I couldn't talk for a week. And I said, what, what are we fucking doing? I can't even sing. And he goes, we'll do all the vocals in the last two days. It'll make it more cohesive. And I was like, oh, okay. So Which is what we did. That's we just, the story behind how you did and why you did all the vocals in 48 hours. Well, I, you know, a vocal takes three minutes. So, I mean, you know, how many... There's 11 tracks on there. 11 mm. times three is what should have taken less than 40 minutes. Mm. You're not one to uh, do 12 takes? Or I, have done, I have done on certain songs, of course, and do a comp. But with Dan, I went out and sang it a couple times and then left. And, you know, he, there might be a, lo- a line that's wrong or, um, you know, where I fluff a word or something. So, and then he might replace that. I don't know how he did it. You know, I got out of there. Well, was, it's, a, it's a great collection of songs. Thanks, yeah. That's what I was really pleased. I see that as a Dan Arbuck album. To be, in mm-hmm. my heart of hearts, that's how I see that album. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, it's more like I guessed it with him. But, uh, you know, of course, I'm very happy to take the credit. And he's the producer. Yeah. And, you know, that's just the way it has to be. You've been called one of rock and roll's greatest survivors. Uh-huh. You've been doing it for so long and still enjoying it and, and doing so well. Well, no one... You know, when I started, it was like sort of a teenager's thing in the 60s is when I got excited about it. And I never thought I'd get in a band because, uh, first of all, I was a girl. I was too shy to play around guys. And, you know, I was, you know, had my little guitar, but I didn't really feel that... I've never felt I'm a very good guitar player, and I never thought I could mix it. But then when I got to London and I was there around seven, 1976, I could see this opening in the net where I could slip through with punk because no one could play. So, you know, it was no longer, and it was all about non-discrimination, so no one was going to mention that I was a girl or anything. I mean, you have a different voice and a different attitude towards certain things, but... Uh, That's a different world today for for a girl rock and roll singer than it was then. Is it? Don't you think? I don't know. For somebody starting out? I don't know. Do you think it might be a little bit easier? Well, I guess you wouldn't know because you're you're not just starting out. What's, I guess it comes down to who it is, who you're talking about, and what the circumstances it's are. Up, it's up to the artist. You know, you do what you want to do. That's the whole point of being an artist, is you're just doing what you want to do. And um, there's not so many bands. I see that. I mean, there are, there are a few bands out there. There's quite a few bands out there. But not like I had in the 60s, when you could just reel off 40 amazing bands. Because they all started when they were like 15, 16. They toured around their local hometown. They could all play. Look at a band like the Moby Grape. You know, where everyone could play, write, they all sang. Um, and then it started getting thin on the ground once MTV came along. Then mm-hmm. it all got filtered through MTV and people started making videos and getting their tits out and it turned into this sort of soft porn fest. And, you know, all the shit rose to the top, frankly. You know, I mean, Captain Beefheart wasn't making videos. I feel very optimistic at the moment because I think we're in a climate now where a new underground will emerge, and I, I can feel that there's going to be a lot of bands coming up. And I feel that's what I thought in 1976, and I was right <laughs> with uh, punk. I've kind of had to ban phones on the, on the bus. We're traveling on the bus because 
you know, someone will say, oh, what was that, uh, oh, what was that song by, and someone has looked it up already. And it takes that kind of um, guesswork out of, or, you know, this sort of trying to, you know, your memory. We don't need them anymore. It's all, it's all there, so. Well, that's one reason why we tell people to keep their phones in their pockets or in their purse during our, our shows. You know, funny you should say that, because I actually didn't notice. And sometimes I have a real freak out when I go out there, especially when, it, when you first walk on stage and they're there. Mm. And it can derail me so badly that I can't really recover from it. It takes me a long time, and, you know, I really start forgetting lyrics, and I don't know what mm. I'm doing, and it's just when they got one right up your snout. Um, so usually I'll say something, but I, I didn't notice them tonight, and I didn't even notice that I didn't yeah, notice. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very which, much. Which is a good thing. Yeah, you know, people don't feel perfect. obligated to take their phones out and shoot every damn song. It's, a, it's and, just a compulsion, though. Yeah, unfortunately. But like I said, I think that'll level off, and there'll be a little protocol where mm. people will say that's just not cool. We've all had a gig ruined, or even going to the cinema and you're sitting there and someone's on their phone, and you know you've got the screen in front of you. It, yeah. No one likes it, but you know no one can stop doing it. <laughs> it is an obsession, the compulsion. It is. I know it's been a long day, so we'll let you go. That's Thank fine. You. I think Martin's so here. I'm Martin sure Martin here. has something to say. How many years has it been, Martin? Well, I've played 50 years now in the same sort of seat. Uh -huh. But 37 years ago yesterday, we did our first show oh, did we? in Buffalo. Buffalo, New York, I assume. That's, That's right. right. That was so, yeah. And every, every night, I have to say, we've had great bands. The original band, of course, the subsequent bands have all been fantastic. But tonight was fantastic, yeah. too. It's always been yeah. great, yeah. mainly yeah. because we've and got And I saw a Charlie Sexton, oh, yeah. Austin boy, last night. Yeah. Of course. And yeah. he reminded me that we, uh, uh, you know, we all played together with uh, J James Honey and Scott. Mm. So, you know, we, he's been with us for a long time, too, Charlie. And there's just all these great players, and especially... When you're in the game for a long time, you just uh, bump into them on the road. I mean, half the time you don't remember what they're mm -hmm. talking about. and Because, you know, everyone was loaded at the time. And, um, <laughs> you know, and you're like, we did. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's, it, it's a kind of, it builds this kind of history you have with people. That's really kind of a, a neat thing. And, you know, like I say, I, I have this feeling about bands. And I think people, that kid I got on at the end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, his mother's 53. She's like 15 years younger than me. Um, and I went out to get some air this afternoon because when we were hanging around and I was sitting in the sun and this kid comes over and he goes, do you mind if I smoke? I said, I don't care, knock yourself out. And then he started talking to me and he said he was going to the show and I was like, oh. So I could see him out there. So, um, and I mean, he's got to be, how old is that guy? 20. Not even. Mm -hmm. I mean, this perfect venue here, we played here. This is the perfect venue here. So. It's just about the right size, 2,000 people, and it's kind of wrapped around the stage, so you Fantastic. feel... Nobody's too far from the stage, right. even yeah. the guys up here that were actually in the darkness that you... I could see everyone, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's great, because, you know, I, I, they want to see us, and I want to see them, so it's the perfect... This is the perfect venue, and, yeah, I mean, and I understand there was cameras, because it's filmed, of course, but, yeah. you know, it's, you know, it's <laughs> slightly... Because, you know, you're kind of... Everyone is, like, really self-conscious up the front, because they don't want to be the, the guy who... Yeah. Breaks but rank. Considering it is is TV, people are pretty loose here. They're they're Austin fans, Fantastic. Austin music fans. You know they don't. Oh, think always about a it. great town to play. I mean, it's yeah. Austin. Everyone knows that. Everyone right. wants to come and play here. And well, we've all done South by Southwest. It used to be uh, World Headquarters, the Armadillo World Headquarters. For mm -hmm. me, it was one mm -hmm. of the best gigs. The ever. Armadillo. We, yeah, early it was just gigs of ours. amazing. Oh, I'm sure. All standing there, right? and all yeah. flat. Like and in the early <clears throat> first band. Yeah. Uh, or and a bunch of pool tables underneath. How much better can you get? Yeah, so yeah. thank Wonderful. you for doing this and for, you know, keeping oh, the band me. thing going yeah. because, you know, everyone loves it, but I think people are, they've got a little complacent. I think they're getting jolted out of that at the moment because of certain political unrest. And, you know, this climate for a, uh, well, the last time we had real political unrest in the 60s is when all those great bands were there. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think Who knows I, I'm an become. optimist. Right. Who yeah, knows my, my motto is, I'm going to be happy if it kills me, and then at least I'll die happy. 